This is the battleship Missouri. 2nd September 1945, she was anchored in Tokyo Bay. And it was at this exact spot that representatives, first from the Empire of Japan and then the various allied nations, applied their signatures to the documents which signified the unconditional surrender of Japan. Let us pray the peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. That this took place aboard Missouri was alone sufficient to cement her place in history books. But she also earned her place through her service record. From the early 1920s until the late 1930s, the United States of America didn't lay down a single new battleship. According to the Washington Treaty of 1922, on limiting naval armaments, the naval superpowers declared a break in building battleships. The main strike force of the US Navy of that period consisted of the so-called standard battleships that entered service during World War I and immediately after it. So the, the battleships we had in the 30s were left over from World War I and the Navy was still using them as the centerpiece of the fleet. All right, the grand scheme was still there was going to be this big, decisive fleet engagement, just, just like in um, Jutland in World War I. So battleships were still the core of the fleet. After Japan had cancelled all agreements on limiting naval armaments in 1936, the break was over. The standard battleships required support from the corresponding fast capital ships in order to successfully counter the upgraded Japanese battle cruisers. So when we would do our war gaming, this is before World War II, war gaming would be against Japanese, for example, Congo-class uh, battleships. And uh, so, yeah, that was, uh, that, that, was, that was the perceived threat in the future would be Japan, the Pacific. All right, so in the 30s, the U.S. did have some intel on what the Japanese Navy was building and constructing. Some of it was good, some of it we found out later on was very, very false. Uh, there were some decisions made in the design process for the, say, the North Carolinas and the South Dakotas prior to the Iowas, based on some of that intel. In late 1937, early 38, intelligence reports started to indicate that the U.S. outmatched Japan so strongly in conventional battleships that the U.S. Navy could now indulge itself in a long-held goal development of a fast battleship. In June 1938, the technical and performance requirements for designing such a ship with a new specially designed main gun were approved. The order to construct the first two such ships was made the following year. Later in 1940, a second pair of battleships was ordered, Missouri and Wisconsin. Specifications of USS Missouri. Total displacement, 57,540 tons. Length, 270.5 meters. Beam, 33 meters. Draft, 11 meters. Armament, primary armament. Nine Mark VII guns in three triple turrets. Caliber, 406 millimeters. Dual purpose artillery. 20 Mark XII guns in 10 coaxial Mark 28 turrets. Caliber 127 millimeters. Anti-aircraft armament. 20 quadruple Bofors guns Mark I. Caliber 40 millimeters. 49 Oerlikon Mark IV autocannons. Air group. Three Vought OS-2U Kingfisher float planes. Armor. Main belt 307 millimeters. Main turrets 184 to 476 millimeters. Conning tower, 184 to 440 millimeters. Main armor deck, 153 to 179 millimeters. Propulsion, four gear turbine engines with eight turbines produced by General Electric. Eight boilers produced by Babcock and Wilcox. Power, 212,000 HP. Maximum speed, about 33 knots. Cruising range, about 20,000 nautical miles at a speed of 15 knots. 
By the end of World War II, the United States had become an undisputed leader in the area of naval radio electronic armament. Thus, the radio location means of the Iowa-class battleships were the best in the world. Missouri was equipped with the most advanced radars for detecting surface and airborne targets. Many of the radars were parts of fire control systems for artillery guns of all calibers. The Japanese uh, did not have the, maybe that technological edge, but they were terrific night fighters and uh, so if they knocked out our higher tech fire control radars, uh, we were somewhat at a disadvantage. So, so that there was a little bit of a an evolution, of course, uh, to improve all that. I think they finally did. The Japanese had great optics, and they had the best night optics in the world. All right but the best optics won't lay up against the smoke screen. A lot of times our guys would lay a smoke screen, the radar director fire control could see right through it. The Japanese couldn't do anything except scatter or try to punch through the smoke screen to get in, get in closer and fight. So took away their advantage. The Montana project that was intended to replace the standard battleships was being developed almost alongside Iowa. The basis for Montana was taken from the South Dakota class battleships. But as a result, a project of a battleship with a displacement of more than 70,000 tons was approved and ordered. Montana's artillery armament was more powerful than that of the Iowa-class battleships by a third. Twelve main guns instead of nine. The ship had to pay for that with a lower speed, 27 knots. The order for construction of the Montana-class battleships was issued in May 1942. But already in 1943, the order was cancelled. Thus, the Iowa-class battleships became the last battleships in the U.S. Navy. Building an Iowa-class battleship is not a trivial exercise, but it was still something well within the capability of American industry. The entire process of building a ship from laying the keel to its introduction into service would take about two and a half years. And so it was that in early of 1945, USS Missouri, the last of the Iowas, arrived in the Pacific Ocean. Following the Battle of Midway, in which the Americans won their first victory, the Japanese shifted to defensive actions, and the balance of forces immediately moved to the US side. By 1943, the Americans had managed to replenish their losses and organize their wartime production. The position of the Japanese at sea was becoming increasingly desperate, so they decided to take extreme measures. In 1945, the kamikaze had become the Japanese weapon of choice to strike against American capital ships, the aircraft carriers and battleships. And in order to stop somebody who is deliberately trying to plow themselves into your ship, you need all the firepower you can get. As a result, Missouri was to be found taking an active part in defending against these attacks, and she suffered from kamikaze as well. On April 11, a kamikaze pilot crashed their plane into the starboard side of Missouri. The plane bounced off the ship and crashed into water. The ship received just a minor damage. Five days later, Missouri was attacked by another kamikaze, but the plane was shot down by the ship's anti-aircraft artillery and crashed directly behind the battleship's rear. The plane's torn off wing crashed into the deck-mounted crane and temporarily disabled it. No crew members were injured during either attack. It was an extremely desperate time, and, um, you know, they sank over 30 of our ships, a uh, couple hundred at least damaged, about 10,000 sailors and marines were killed or wounded at sea. And the U.S. was not expecting them whatsoever. So it was very much a shock in the beginning, because they were shooting at the planes, and they were continuing to come in. The new enemy tactic required prompt counteraction. Aircraft carrier air support groups were increased in numbers. Each ship received four or five fighter squadrons instead of one or two. The anti-aircraft defenses of battleships were also improved. Eight Oerlich and 20mm twin guns were additionally installed on Missouri. They started to do a lot of efforts on the ships by increasing all the anti-aircraft fits, putting guns everywhere on the deck that could fit them, or 
overloading the ships with crew, guns, and ammo. They shoehorned in the crews. Habitability was thrown out the window. More guns meant the ship would survive better. So more 40 millimeters, more 20 millimeters. They put them everywhere. They could bolt them to the deck. The problem with them was is they wouldn't they had to literally shoot the plane apart to keep it from hitting the ship. So they were finding very quickly that the little 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns became very ineffective. So they were putting more 40 millimeters on ships, more five inch on the ships that they could. So when they came in, we basically filled the sky. Any gun on the ship that could bring the bear on the plane was fired on it. And they kept firing until the plane fell apart or hit the water. Missouri operated in the Okinawa waters until May 5. During that time, the ship took part in deflecting 12 daytime and four nighttime air raids. The ship's anti-aircraft defense crew destroyed five enemy airplanes on their own and six more planes jointly with other ships. Then came the day of September 2, 1945, when Japan signed the terms of unconditional surrender on board Missouri. The war in the Pacific ended. The American Iowa class battleships were considered to be the state of the art of the warship designs of armor and artillery and the arrival of USS Missouri was the exclamation point on this type's development in the US. The ships did receive significant post-war updates. Following the end of World War II, the US Navy had more than 20 battleships. During the first post-war years, all these battleships were transferred to the reserve. The majority of them were decommissioned. As a result, by the end of the 1940s, the only battleship that remained in service was Missouri. There were good reasons for that. And the main reason for that was because our president was Harry S. Truman from the state of Missouri, who, uh, whose daughter at Christmas ship earlier in 1944. And he made a, um, basically a declaration that as long as he's uh, commander in chief, president of the United States, that, that we'd, we'd keep the battleship Missouri active. During the Korean War between 1950 and 1953, Battleship Missouri completed two month long combat raids to the peninsula shores and supported American troops with her artillery fire. As they were trying to break out of Incheon. So she spent her entire first tour over there just bombarding, they had, trying to destroy supply lines, trains, um, any artillery positions, troops in the open, anything our guys on the ground deemed too powerful for them to take care of. And because of the geography of Korea, a lot of stuff had to be near the coastline. All right, so the guns can reach 23 nautical miles or 26 statute miles pretty accurately. She got in pretty close to the shore. Good amount of stuff is within range of her guns. Right. So she destroyed a lot of a lot of targets over there. Fired a couple of thousand rounds from the main guns. Uh, tens of thousands of rounds from the five-inch guns. Uh, they closed that one out in March of, of 1953, and back stateside and and uh, went into training and upkeep cycles and so forth. In February 1955, Missouri was transferred to the reserve. However, giant ships with formidable guns were a perfect fit for demonstrating the greatness of the United States in the world. That's why, 35 years later, in the spring of 1980, the US Congress approved a proposal to reinstate and rearm all four Iowa-class battleships. On May 10, 1986, Battleship Missouri entered service again. Two things are going on. Our, our, we, our new president was uh, Ronald Reagan, and um, who was very aggressive about uh, rebuilding our forces and, and also counting, uh, because we we're still in the Cold War, so uh, uh, his, his goal, I think, was to end the Cold War, you know, and, um, and so basically to, to counter the old Soviet, uh, 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 Soviet Union, you know, the shipbuilding and the, the military buildup, decision was made to bring back the Iowa class, and with these Iowa class, had relatively lower use on them, um, and although they're very expensive, they still decided they would they would uh, 
get them back into service. That was uh, that was the prime reason why they they resurrected them after all 30 years or so. Missouri's swan song was her participation in the Gulf War during Operation Desert Storm in early 1991. For the first time in almost 40 years, the ship's guns opened fire at a real target, a well-protected Iraqi bunker. So they joined in the initial tomahawk strike, and then both of them cruised further north, got in close to the shore, and let loose with the guns. And that was the last time the guns were ever fired in anger in history. Uh, Missouri fired around 800 rounds from the 16-inch guns, and Wisconsin got off about three or 400 from her main guns. That was the last military operation for Missouri. In January 1995, the battleship was officially retired from the Navy. When the decision was made to turn her into a museum ship, many American states wanted to get their hands on the battleship of victory. The choice was made in favor of Pearl Harbor, where Missouri opened as a museum ship in late January 1999. Also, she's the symbolic end of World War II. The, the surrender ceremony took place on her decks. The war ended on her deck. The war for the U.S. started officially with the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Arizona was sunk that day. When they brought the Missouri in here, the best place they could think of putting her was immediately astern of her. They built, the pier was built over here prior to that. It was a perfect spot to stick her. So when they moored her here, they raised the, the um, guns up as symbolically watching over the Arizona and about three quarters of her crew that are still on board. So you basically have the bookends of the war, beginning for the Ar with the Arizona, the end with the Missouri. You can win Missouri by answering the following question. When was Missouri put afloat? You must fulfill the following conditions for your answer to be accepted. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, make a clip with the correct answer out of this video, add a description and hashtag to it, and publish it in a public post on Twitter. Leave a comment under this video that includes your name on the social network, nickname in the game, and the server you play on. Now this, you really hate to see. And especially at tier 10, this kind of map position is is rough. I expect, I guess, that people have learned a little bit of the basics of this game by the time you get to tier 10, at least you hope so. But apparently not always. So in this one, just take a look at the map and where my team is going to end up. This is going to be well, it's it's a loss based on the team positioning. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I am going to be incredibly useless this game. I should have recognized what was going on, and I should have played differently. And I'm going to talk about what I could have done differently. Probably wouldn't change the outcome of the match, but I could have played differently to make things a little bit closer. So just know that <laughs> I'm not going to be uh, this isn't going to be a complaining video this is going to be a what could have I done differently but it is interesting to see my entire team come over to this flank and specifically on this map you really have to at least contest both sides you don't have to win both sides but at least have a presence on both sides of the map otherwise you very literally get caught in a quarter of the map it's very evenly divided into quarters this map and if the enemy team gets a hold of three quarters of the map, you're pretty much guaranteed a loss. So 
I understand that this game is not the easiest thing in the world to learn, especially given that there's really no information given by the game to kind of let you know where you want to play, how you want to play. You're just kind of, okay, click battle and you go. You do your thing. And in this match, like I said, I'm going to be very useless. I was nearing the end of a stream at this point, so I didn't really want to... Uh, play too seriously in this one and <laughs> get upset about a team that is probably going to lose anyway. So where could have I played? I could have played in C. That's where I should have been. I'm in a Moskva, I'm in a radar cruiser, and I should have been in C. But I'm not. I am in a position at the back of the map being useless farming damage. And that's what I wanted to do this game, honestly. I went into it thinking, okay, I need my snowflake on the Moskva. Moskva with the legendary mod is a really good long range farming ship and it's relaxing, easy to play. That's what I went into this as, but if we're looking to win the game, we're going to try and push C. That's what we need to. I needed to recognize my team at this point has completely given up the A flank and we need to have a strong presence in C. So having an extra radar, maybe some defensive fire, extra AA support, that kind of thing would have helped my team a ton. I probably would have died, um, given that there's a carrier and playing on an island as a cruiser against a carrier, like I mentioned in my last video, doesn't tend to go well, but it is an Immelman, so I might have gotten away with it. You can see the enemy Moskva is actually in a much better position than I am. He's leaving it though, but if he would have held on that island, that would have been an amazing position for him to play. That's really what it comes down to, recognizing what your team is doing. And it's possible to win matches like this. I'm not saying it isn't. That's uh, the really interesting thing about this game, is you can make some bad decisions on positioning and still win games. And it really does come down to, well, if we're all on this one side of the map, we have to win it. So aggressive pushes with your entire team, and you probably can win matches like this in random battles. The teamwork side is a little bit hard to coordinate in this game, given that, uh, well, it's randoms, right? You don't control your teammates. But in this one, I do think I could have done a much better job. By being at sea, I would have provided so much information for my team, right? Just having that radar there, having that extra defensive fire helped would have helped my team a ton. So I think that either C or maybe even B at this point, in between C and B, that kind of thing is where I should have been playing. You can see my team is kind of stalled out there, right? They kind of formed this line on the G-line. They're really not sure what to do, where to go, how to push. They don't have information on what they, what's ahead of them. And a radar could have helped a ton with that. So, poor positioning on my part, but we're gonna play the Moskva as this kind of long range AG spammer that it's so good at. And I think in this next little bit here, you're gonna see exactly why I love propulsion mod on my cruisers. It is, so good for dodging salvos. It really is. You maybe uh, could get away with something like the damage control or maybe even rudder shift if you're going at full speed most of the time. But I do find myself often getting into situations where I just want to hold position and move forward and back and forward and back. And we're going to not dodge everything, but we're going to dodge quite a bit and rack up quite a bit of potential damage. At this point... <laughs> Yeah, this map position is just hilarious, isn't it? <laughs> We've got no caps, and uh, yeah, this is this is not looking so good, that's for sure. And that's why, again, being in the C cap, or trying to contest the B cap, would have given our team so much more information, and stalling a cap, right? Cap points are ticking, and assuming you have all three caps in domination, it actually ticks pretty quick. It's not the fastest tick, it's not like the uh, epicenter ones, or maybe an arms race. That one is insanely fast, that final cap zone. But given that you have all three caps, they tick quick enough that the game is going to be over very, very, very soon. But uh, Moskva, as you can see, is a very easy ship to use at longer ranges. For those of you that don't have it, I don't know if it's necessarily worth giving up all that coal for especially since it doesn't really offer that interesting of a playstyle. Um, it's much harder to push in with this ship compared to something like the Petro that you can get for free. Well, it costs your time, basically, to grind it out, but, you know, you're not spending your major resources, right? 
it's still a really strong ship though. You have a incredibly good radar, especially now that Stalin has been nerfed on its radar duration. We looked at that yesterday. And you've got one of the longest range, longest duration radars in the game. Still very strong, pretty good for competitive too. It's just that, like the Stalin, you no longer have fire prevention. So it's not quite as tanky to fires, but intelligent use of your throttle in situations like this, you can dodge a lot. We're already up to a million potential damage in a cruiser, which is admittedly a very tanky cruiser, <laughs> but it is still a cruiser. And we're farming down these battleships quite well. The fire chance is good, and most importantly, the shell velocity is really good. So if you're someone who maybe wants to play something like the Des Moines, but you find yourself struggling with leading, that kind of thing. Moscow is really, really nice, where you don't have to focus so hard on leading your shots, predicting where the enemy is going to go. You almost can just point and click on people, <laughs> given the shell velocity. Right? It's less than 10 seconds out to eight kilometer, or 18 kilometers range. It's, that's pretty quick. Our Holland, as you can see, has capped C now, and you know, is trying to keep this game alive. And our team is actually kind of pushed back towards A a little bit now as well. So you can see how if I had been a little more aggressive in this game, used my radar better, helped maybe get rid of their DD, because there's only one destroyer and one submarine, this game could have turned around. Um, afterwards, of course, <laughs> looking back on things, it's very easy to see what you did wrong. In the moment, of course, it's a little harder to know what to do and what the right um, positioning play is. And it's not like I'm doing anything particularly wrong here. You know, we're getting good damage here, and at the end score, you're going to see that I'm actually top on this team. But that doesn't mean that I contributed to the win, or I was the <laughs> most impactful player on this team, right? That's not really what the uh, end scores card uh, actually tells you, right? That's one of the unfortunate parts about ranked and the save star system, just a, just a little miniature aside there, that uh, the save star system is really bad for ranked just because you can play a game to save a star, and that really doesn't help your team win. And that's kind of the unfortunate thing about ranked, is then you're incentivized to play to save your star, not incentivized to win. So. If I were to change it, I would just remove the save star mechanic, and that way everybody would try and play positions, play their ship in a way to win. Um, but let's not uh, get too uh, deep into that discussion for now. You can see moving forward and back is pretty good. We're dodging a lot of these salvos, and that is a Hindenburg and a Thunder. So pretty scary HE spam against me, given that the Hindenburg can full pen through my 50 millimeter plating. And of course, we all know how good Thunderer HE is, right? <laughs> um, in this position, of course, I'm trying to get myself in an area where I can go dark if I want to. Moskva, of course, has some pretty poor concealment, much like Stalingrad around that 14 kilometer mark. So it's hard to go dark. It's hard to get undetected if you're under too much fire. But these very good arcs and the ship just being really good at long range allows you to play positions like this where you can potentially um, go dark like this and not get shot at. It's really quite nice to uh, play like this and unfortunately in this game, like I said, it did lead to our team not being able to pull out the win on this, on this occasion. But you can see our Montana, Smolensk, battleships on the other side of the map, they're pushing hard. Um, they tried. They, they ended up dying, but they definitely tried more than I did. And yet, in this end screen, you're going to see I was top on the team, even though I was very useless. So, I don't know what the exact point of this video was, but maybe just a little PSA to <laughs> try to be helpful for your team, unlike me here, and try to play both sides of the map. Don't just go to one and lemming train. <laughs> like I said in yesterday's video...
Welcome to our YouTube channel. This is the second episode of Rico Chet, the best warship show in the world. Here, guns test armor for durability. Torpedoes test anti-torpedo defenses. Besides that, in our show, we set up incredible experiments to find out which ship is cooler. My dear colleague, I've already told you many times that they are all good. It's the player's skills that matter. All of them are good? Let's see if that's true right now. Rico Chet kicks off. Our heroes today are two tier eight cruisers. The first one is Charles Martel. Nine 203 millimeter guns. Firing range, 17.6 kilometers. Maximum armor piercing shell damage, 4,900. Which means that the French ship can deal a total of 44,100 damage per salvo. Chao Martel's Citadel is protected by 100 millimeter of armor, while the Citadel armor itself is 40 millimeters thick. The French ship is going to confront a Dutch one, Harlem. Here, we also have nine 203 millimeter guns, and the maximum armor piercing shell damage is 4,800. The Dutch ship can deal a total of 43,200 damage per salvo. The cruiser is protected. With 27 millimeters of plating plus a 200 millimeter thick armor belt. Ha! How do you like her? Oh, yeah, that's impressive. But that's not all. The bow end of the Dutch cruiser is protected with a 40 millimeter armor belt. In battle, such armor allows the ship to take hits even from battleships. The ships are here, the viewers are here, it's time to find out who is stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, sirs and madams, in the previous episode, you made a choice between Italian Dasha and British Dasha. Italian Dasha has won. Grazie mille amici. In today's vote, we have Fräulein Dasha from Germany and Ms. Dasha from the United States. For those who made the winning votes, we've prepared. Let's start with the perfect shot. Hey, wait, let's explain the perfect shot rules for our viewers. In this test, we align the ships parallel to each other. Charles Martel will be the first to fire. With three Harlems as targets positioned 5, 10, and 15 kilometers away, the French ship will fire a single experimental armor-piercing shell. It is exactly the same as a standard shell, with the only difference being that the dispersion mechanics do not apply to it. We only use it in ricochet to achieve the desired results. These shells fly exactly to the point the shooter is aiming at. And the shooter is aiming at the Citadel. Yes, exactly. The aiming point is the center of the ship's hull at the waterline level. In the second test, the ships will reverse their roles. Harlem will fire at three Charles Martels. The ship that scores the most Citadel hits will be declared the winner. Let's get started. First shot. The distance is five kilometers. 1600 damage. Harlem's armor withstood it. Let's see what happens at 10 kilometers. The shell hits the torpedo protection. Zero damage. Unexpected. A salvo at 15 kilometers. Same as the first shot. 1617 damage. Oh well, no Citadel hit scored. Which means that Harlem has a great chance to take the lead in our show. The targets are ready. Harlem is ready too. Salvo. Over penetration and one tenth of the full damage. Okay, okay. A salvo from 10 kilometers. Well done. It's a Citadel hit. Before congratulating Harlem on her victory, let's see her fire from 15 kilometers, just to be sure. 1,584 damage, quite decent. Okay, it's 1-0 for the Dutch cruiser. Exactly. Harlem's armor withstood the shells from Charles Martel. But we still have more tests. It's time to move on to combat salvo. But first, a commercial. Ladies and gentlemen, our company welcomes you. Fly our airlines. Travel on our liners. 
Take a romantic underwater cruise and see the most picturesque spots of our game. We're also making preparations for the first intergalactic journey. After crossing hundreds of thousands of light years, you will find yourself... You will find yourself on the polygon! Go on a safari to hand down the most dangerous sea beasts from the far reaches of space. Ladies and gentlemen, we're looking forward to seeing you. In this test, the targets and distances are the same. Only this time, the ships will fire a full salvo with AP shells, just like in a regular battle. The shooter will fire only one salvo at each target. The ship that scores a Citadel hit wins. If neither ship scores a Citadel hit, the one that deals more damage wins. Who is starting? Charles Martel, which lost in the first test. A salvo from five kilometers. One over penetration, three penetrations, and 5,300 damage. 10 kilometers. Two, two, two. Two over penetrations, two penetrations, and two non penetrations. 42, 14 damage. Hey, are you sure Martel can hit citadels? Wait, we still have a target at 15 kilometers. Three over penetrations, and three penetrations. Damage 63, 21. Charles Martel's result is almost 16,000 damage. No Citadel hits. It's Harlem's turn. The first salvos from five kilometers. Seven over penetrations and one torpedo protection hit. The result is predictable, a little more than 3,000. 10 kilometers, nine shells are in the air. Citadel hit, 6,700 damage, four over penetrations, and one penetration. But it was a good one. Okay, 15 kilometers. 6,864 damage, and a Citadel hit again. It means 2-0 for Harlem, right? Exactly. Two tests and two victories. Excellent. This may be excellent, but Charles Martel has a chance to catch up to the Dutch ship in the next test. Our heroes will both act as targets. First, three Charles Martels will be positioned at the familiar distances. Then three Harlems will replace them. Battleship Amargi, a ship with one of the largest calibers at Tier 8, will fire at our cruisers. 10 4 10 millimeter guns. The maximum damage from an armor piercing salvo is 126,000. The Japanese battleship will aim at the center of the ship's hull at the waterline level. She will fire one full salvo from all her guns at each ship. A few words about the rules. In this test, victory will be scored for the cruiser, cruisers to be more exact, that lose the fewest hit points. Basically, the victory will go to the cruiser that receives the lowest damage from Amagi. Amargi is ready to fire. Off we go. The first target, 5,000 damage. The second target. 13,860 and a Citadel hit. The third target. Yippee, this is a one shot. Amargi's salvo destroyed the third Charles Martel. With three salvos fired at the French cruisers, Amargi inflicted 49,700 damage. The Harlems are up next. Firing distance, no changes. Off we go. Five kilometers. Oh, incredible. An intact Harlem is sent to the port right off the bat. 10 kilometers. Ooh, that was close. 28,000 damage. And finally, 15 kilometers. Just one more time. Almost 30,500. Amargi is a true nightmare for Harlem. Amargi caused 95,000 damage on the second try. I told you that Martel had every chance to catch up to Harlem, and this is it. The score is 2-1, still for Harlem. But this is just the result of our show. In a regular battle, Amargi can easily destroy both three Charles Martels and three Harlems. Blah, blah, blah. 2-1, that's it. We have a secondary gun test ahead. But first, a short commercial break. 
the only battleship with powerful guns and almost impenetrable armor at her tier. Her secondary battery is capable of firing over distances equivalent to almost 40 football fields. A legend that still exists in metal. The one and only Mikasa. Call now. Well, in this test, it's the secondary battery that will act as the main firepower. But since the secondary guns of our two cruisers are far from the strongest, we've decided to see how long the cruisers will survive under fire from two grosser Kurfers. By the way, the Kurfers will have fully upgraded secondary batteries. Consequently, the cruisers will have a tough time. The cruiser that survives the German shells for the longest time will be declared the winner. Both Germans will be at a distance of 5 kilometers from the cruiser on the left and right sides. Now, let's do this! Charles Martel survived 52 seconds under the secondary battery fire. It's Harlem's turn now. Forty-seven seconds, and the Dutch cruiser gets a ticket back to the port. Can you explain why Charles Martel, with her worse armor, survived longer than Harlem? It's not a matter of armor. If you noticed, both cruisers were set on fire during the gunfire. So, Harlem has a longer fire extinguishing time than that of her French counterpart. Oh, I see. Everything's clear now. It's also clear that the score in today's Ricochet is now 2-2. Have you tried our water yet? Dark water? Light water? Transparent water? Hot water? Oh, salt water? Nice water? Refreshing water? Frosty water. Water in World of Warships? You can sail on it, fight on it, drown enemies. You can sink in it, you can dive into it, you can fly over it, bomb it, torpedo it, launch rockets. It's the best water in the world. Water in World of Warships. Try it and you'll love it too. We're back. You're still watching the Rico Chet Show, where two ships sort out which of them is cooler. In our show, we also test ships to demonstrate what they are capable of. Today's participants are Tier 8 cruisers Charles Martel and Harlem, which represent France and the Netherlands, respectively. Let's announce a new test. Let's try out torpedoes. But Harlem has no torpedoes. No big deal. She'll use airstrike instead. Our cruisers will employ this armament against a really huge and formidable enemy, the one that has the biggest HP pool. How about Battleship Kremlin? She'll do. She has 46% anti-torpedo protection. Her deck armor is 60 millimeters thick, and she boasts 108,300 HP. The cruiser that sinks Kremlin with fewer attacks with auxiliary weapons wins. The battleship, like the cruisers, will remain stationary. For this reason, Charles Martel can only use one side. This test might not be so fair and square. But it will be fun. Off we go. Again. Charles Martel starts first. <laughs> Three drops, nine torpedoes, and Kremlin is back in port. Well, not bad. Don't forget that in addition to the main damage caused by torpedoes, Kremlin also lost hit points from flooding twice. Yes, that's right. But Harlem will also inflict damage by causing fire in addition to the direct damage from her bombs. By the way, here's our Dutch cruiser. It took Harlem three airstrikes and 42 bomb hits. Yes, three as well. But there's something to point out here. The thing is that airstrike bombs cover a large area. Yes, I noticed that not all the bombs hit Kremlin. Exactly. But those that did hit the target caused fire on the battleship's deck. At one point, there were four fires on Kremlin. Perhaps Kremlin took more damage from the fires than from the bombs. It doesn't matter. It took both ships three attempts to sink a Tier 10 battleship with their secondary armament. We have a draw in this test. So, the total score so far is also a draw. 3-3. Three, three. But we have one more test left.
we decided to find out how far the cruiser can travel from the border of the map while being attacked by three Midway aircraft carriers. No maneuvering, movement only along a straight course at full speed. The aircraft are under the control of artificial intelligence, so the cruisers will both have a fair chance to go as far as possible. For the first attempt, the cruisers will be without any upgrades or commander skills. In the second race, we'll fully reinforce their AA defenses. Also, a priority AA sector and the defensive AA fire consumable will be activated regularly. The winner will be the cruiser that travels farthest along a straight course than the other one over two races. In her first attempt, Charles Martel managed to travel almost four squares, judging by the mini-map. Harlem was sunk as soon as she reached the third square. The second race, but first, another commercial break. Got a fever from four fires? Citadel hurts from being hit. Started taking in water quickly? Hit points fading fast. Not a problem. Take advantage of our marvelous medicines. The Warships Pharmaceuticals Company is happy to present innovative treatments for fires, drowning, and issues related to the loss of hit points. Damage Control Party and Repair Party. These are the best remedies for fighting ships' troubles. And also, we have a novelty product, Specialized Repair Teams. It restores your HP pool much more efficiently. It's the perfect choice for British battleships. This is not an anti-fire solution. Check with your ship commander before use. 12 plus. We're back again. This is the Rico Chet Show, and we're about to conduct the Ocean Race Test. As we've already mentioned, our cruisers will have commander skills mastered and upgrades equipped in the final race. All of them improve air defense. And here we have almost even results. Both ships were destroyed after passing four squares. Well, we can announce the result. In the ocean race, Charles Martel wins by a narrow margin. Which means that a French ship has won in two shows in a row. The score is 4-3 for Charles Martel. Despite the fact that Charles Martel prevailed, I think both cruisers are good. In fact, I personally think that the main thing in our game is to command your ship wisely. To keep her strengths and weaknesses in mind and not to expose your sides to Amagi's salvos. This was the second episode of Ricochet, a show where we pit two ships against each other. We test their durability in the most extreme tests. Tell us in the comments what two ships you would like to see face off against each other in our next episode. Remember to hit the like button under the video and subscribe to our channel. See ya!
captains, are you ready to see the most unbelievable warship show in the world? Are you eager to witness the most daring experiments and crazy records? If your answer is yes, then Rio Chet is for you. The show starts right here, right now. Guns, guns, big guns, small guns, medium guns, power, force, and big bada boom. Do you know what I like even more than bada boom? When an armor piercing shell explodes right in the citadel. Bada boom in the citadel sounds awesome, but don't forget about the armor. Sturdy and reliable, it is almost impenetrable, especially if it's hit at an angle. Impenetrable, you say? We'll find out right now. Guns against armor and armor against guns. Battleship versus battleship. That's a great plan. As reliable as Kitakami's 40 torpedoes. The first one tries to score some Citadel hits, while the other has to withstand these blows and respond in kind. To make the picture complete, we get to witness the power of their secondaries. Who will win in our Rico Chet standoff? You'll find out very soon. First, let's present our challengers. A recognized veteran of our game. A battleship straight from the legends. The incredible Yamato. Nine 460 millimeter guns. Armor piercing shell damage, 14,800. Broadside salvo damage, 133,200. Her Citadel armor is 410 millimeters thick. Her opponent was designed under the sunshine of the French Riviera. A ship so fast that she's the envy of all cruisers. Battleship Republique. Eight 431 millimeter guns. Armor piercing shell damage, 14,500. Salvo damage, 116,000. The Citadel's armor protection is 515 millimeters in total. To maintain the integrity of our experiment, we'll carry out the tests without upgrades and commander skills. The first test, perfect shot. Yamato begins. His targets are four Republics, some 5, 10, 15, and 20 kilometers away. Fire! Wait, wait, there's an important point. We are firing an experimental single shell. Its characteristics are similar to those of the standard Yamato shell, but the dispersion mechanics do not apply to it. A shell like this always hits the aiming point. The battleship that fires will always aim at the hull center at the waterline level. First, a commercial break before the firestorm. From the creators of Detective Clibero and Two Knights, the legends were true. Hordes of underwater monsters have awakened. Based on unreal events. Hey, are they b, b biting into our flesh? Like a knife through butter, buddy. One bite and you're a zombie. I don't want to die like this. No, we won't die. This is the place. We'll fight together because we're a family. But there are too many of them. We're the team's last hope to battle. Team's last hope, only in cinemas, coming soon. The first target is five kilometers distant. A shot. That's a Citadel hit. Ten kilometers. Fire. What? Over penetration, 1,480 damage. How about 15 kilometers? A shot. Penetration, 4,884? Republique is taking the punch. The last distance, 20 kilometers. Non penetration. What a twist. I can understand over penetration. The shell is 460 millimeters after all. But the next shot, that's Republique's armor in play. Okay, you convinced me. Now it's the Frenchman's turn to send armor-piercing packages to Yamato. The first shot, 
14,500 damage, and the Citadel hit, of course. 10 kilometers now. Woohoo! Another one. 15 kilometers. Citadel hit. 20 kilometers. The shell is in the air. Penetration. Incredible. A Citadel hit. Republic wins. So, one to zero. We didn't appreciate her. We treated her like a thing. And nature is punishing us for it. Fuso has disappeared from random battles. Captains, you still have a chance to save the world. Research Fuso and take her into battle. Fill World of Warships with new battleships. This video was prepared with the support of the Fuso Preservation Society. The next test in Ricochet is Combat Salvo. Only now we will select one of the Tier 10 battleships as a target. Let it be. Montana! Why Montana? Because she's a decent battleship and is often seen in battle, an ideal target. Okay, let's go with Montana. Distance, no changes. But this time, a typical main battery salvo, just like in a regular battle. The aiming point is the same spot. The losing Yamato starts. Five kilometers, nine guns, fire! 45,732 damage, five penetrations, and one overpenetration. Two Citadel hits. 10 kilometers, one overpenetration, four penetrations, and 40,848 damage. Fantastic! 15 kilometers, salvo! And two Citadel hits. 35,520 damage. Four over penetrations and two penetrations. It's high time to test the armor penetration at 20 kilometers. Shells are in the air. 14,208 damage, three hits, and three over penetrations. Yamato's total damage is excellent. Of course, there are hits to the casemate, deck, and superstructures due to dispersion. However, the lion's share of damage went to the Citadel. Although Yamato is a veteran of our game, she's still a very dangerous opponent, capable at any range. Blah, blah, blah. Let Republic show you who the real threat is. The French ship is ready to fire her first salvo. Four penetrations, 20,590 damage. Heh, I thought there would be more. That's okay, we'll see. 10 kilometers. 44,850 damage, five penetrations, two Citadel hits. The next range is 15 kilometers. 11,000 damage, two penetrations, and two over penetrations. Could it be that Republic has forgotten how to knock out Citadels? The final salvo in this test, 20 kilometers. 4,785 and one hit. In the combat salvo test, Yamato won by a long shot over... Montana! Okay, okay, just kidding. The score is one to one. The score is one to one, and a new test. Penetrate if you can. A training room created to fire at ships without any hindrance. We have 12 targets. All of them are standing at certain angles. For example, the First Republic is at a very sharp, almost zero angle. At the same time, the side of the last French ship is at a 71 degree angle relative to Yamato. Firing from all available guns. I say available because Yamato can't fire all of her main guns at the closest four targets. The battleship cannot move and there's no turning the hull. The objective of the competition is to score Citadel hits. Yamato did 51,356 damage to the first seven targets, but there were no Citadel hits. At first, only six guns could fire, and their shells would hit the superstructures and ends very often. The Japanese ship causes the first damage to the eighth target, which is 13.4 kilometers away and at a 50-degree angle. 
Yamato showed the best results when firing at the 10th target, which was at a 62 degree angle. The Japanese ship scored 19,852 damage with that salvo. Firing at targets 11 and 12 earned Yamato neither high damage numbers nor Citadel hits. A maximum of 19,000 and no Citadel hits. Heh, and I truly believed in good old Yamato. It's Republic's turn. The first seven targets hardly lend themselves to the armor-piercing augments of the French ship. Only 17,000 damage. On the other hand, she managed to penetrate the Citadel and deal an unbelievable 25,000 damage to the 10th target, which is at a 62-degree angle. The 11th and 12th targets added a little over 15,000 damage in total to the French ship's score. It's worth noting that Yamato has a vulnerable area between the barbettes of the forward main battery turrets. Here, high-caliber shells from battleships and some cruisers can penetrate the Citadel's armor, and several French shells hit it precisely because of the dispersion. In any case, the goal is achieved. Despite the fact that Yamato caused more damage in total, Republic wins this competition because the French ship managed to penetrate the Citadel more often. So, the score is 2-1 to one in Republic's favor. Yamato still has a chance, though. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're choosing the best Dasha Perova. Please vote in the comments. Which Dasha is better? You need to choose between Italian Dasha and British Dasha. The winner will get... Secondaries. It's time for the main battery to rest. Let's have some fun. Yamato's 12 dual purpose 127 millimeter mounts and two 155 millimeter mounts versus Republic's eight 127 millimeter mounts and three 152 millimeter mounts. First, without modules and commander skills. The battleship that sinks a destroyer five kilometers away wins. In the second case, Yamato and Republic will fire at each other. We'll repeat both experiments, but with fully upgraded secondary batteries. So, destroyer Shimakaze is the target. It's Republic's turn. Off we go! The French ship needed 31 secondary battery hits and 2 minutes 59 seconds to turn the Japanese destroyer into scrap. Now it's Yamato's turn. Shimakaze sank 2 minutes and 54 seconds later, after 26 hits and one fire aboard. It's time to pit two battleships against each other. The distance is the same, 5 kilometers. I've been waiting for this since the video started. Republic wins in this confrontation by sinking her opponent in 5 minutes and 5 seconds. Republic scored 155 hits and set Yamato ablaze 5 times. The Japanese managed to hit Republic 142 times, set her deck ablaze 4 times, and deal almost 90,000 damage. In the competition of secondary batteries without upgrades, each of the battleships won one of the nominations, so they both get a point. And the total score in our Rico Chet is 3 to 2 in Republic's favor. Let's repeat this test, but with fully upgraded secondaries on both battleships. Only 38 seconds, and the destroyer is in the port. 28 hits. That's a great result. Now it's up to Republic to repeat or improve on the Japanese ship's result. Fifty-two seconds and twenty-six hits. Well, Grandma Yamato and her secondary battery score the second victory in our duel. Now let's find out whose secondary battery is more powerful. Are the battleships ready? Is the audience ready? Let's go! Pub 
Ligue. Vive la France. Two minutes, 50 seconds. 306 hits and seven fire instances. As for Yamato, she scored 243 hits, started four fires, and dealt only 67,328 damage. Well, in this test, Yamato and Republique scored one point each again. The score is 4-3, to three, which means that the French battleship won the first episode of Rico Chet. Let's not forget about the random factor and player skills. In battle, it's not the vehicle that wins, but the person who controls it. So, continue improving your skills, Captains, and we'll continue to supply you with new episodes of Ricochet, the show where two ships determine which of them has stronger firepower and more reliable armor. If you like the show, tell us in the comments what ships you would like to see in the next Rico Chat. Don't forget to like this video like a true captain and subscribe to our channel.